There's nothing more pleasing to a developer than the words, no money down. At the Commodore Hotel, Trump saw firsthand the incredible lightness of leverage, so he tried it again. No rundown neighborhood to build up this time, though. It was literally a Tiffany location, adjacent to the famed store on Fifth Avenue in the heart of Manhattan. Here he would build an edifice to himself, a retail atrium, all marble and bronze, 13 floors of offices, the rest expensive apartments. Trump Tower. Donald called me up one day in my office at about quarter to 12, said meet me at Bombwood Teller in 15 minutes. Naturally, I dropped everything I was doing and came right over here. And the first thing Donald said, isn't this the greatest location in the world? We're gonna, we're gonna build the most exciting building in the world here. If the Hyatt had been a term paper in doing business in New York, the tower was a doctoral thesis. Here's how it worked. Again, get someone to finance it. Equitable had been in on the Hyatt and owned the land under Bonwitz. For a 50% interest, Equitable would pay him to build. Then get the players who can deal with the city, state, and community. Again, Roy Cohn came on board. Finally, find a way to get approval to replace a seven-story building with a 58-story tower. Trump was determined to have every square foot he could have, and so the battle began. And it took us 15 months uh, with a lot of shivers up our, our backs, uh, never knowing whether we were going to win or not win. But Trump is a, a brilliant taskmaster at maneuvering behind the scenes politically as well as uh, in the real estate world. And he succeeded. Once again, Trump got millions in tax abatements by finding a loophole in a law designed to promote middle-income housing. To neutralize the opposition in future battles, he soon hired the city's housing chief, who had opposed him on those tax abatements. In 1986, after the building had been completed, Trump broke one of his cardinal rules. He bought out his partner, Equitable, and that cost him money. No matter, it would seem then, if the Hyatt had made him a player in New York, Trump Tower had made him a player in the world. Trump Tower was Reagan-era beauty come true for everyone. Trump was praised for his work, even by the critic he loved to hate. I've never minded the atrium that much as a work of design. A lot of people find it too glitzy, that uh, sort of rosy, pink, apricot, whatever you call it, peach-colored marble. I always found kind of neat, actually. It's, uh, it's sensual, it's almost sexy. Uh, it's one of the few cases in which somebody has managed to make glitz aesthetically convincing. I like very much the, uh, the Trump Tower because, uh, especially the lobby, because it, it says exactly what it's intended to say, which is spend, spend, spend as you've never spent before. What about the apartments? At $1 million for two bedrooms, they're some of the most expensive in the city. Trump boasts they are the best. The molding, the base molding is the cheapest, it, it, it's what housing projects get. The, the kitchens, if I was in a housing project, I would have had a better built kitchen than what Donald Trump put in Trump Tower. The kitchens were... <laughs> I've, I've never seen more sloppily installed and more cheaply built kitchen cabinets. All of my clients you know, ripped them out. The tower was also home to Trump and his family. Their 36-room suite had three floors, a waterfall, a 100-foot living room, and a lavishly decorated ceiling he once compared to the Sistine Chapel. Ross McTaggart was the second designer brought in to manage this remarkable apartment. I was once in Christie's Furniture, and we were looking at some pieces there, and he focused on some Louis XVI pieces. Superb, I mean, incredible quality. But he didn't understand the price. They were estimated to be at eighty to $120,000 sale, which wasn't bad, really, you know, for 200-year-old furniture. That's superb quality. And Blaine Trump, who works at Christie's, happened to be there, his um, sister-in-law. And he said, well, why is this furniture going to be so expensive? You know, just because it's old? And she said, well, well no, it's, it's, it's the quality. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's got a history. And he turned to me and he said, well, my stuff is better than this that I'm having made. I said, well, actually, no, I have a little bit of problem with the furniture that's been selected. It's not, it's not this kind of quality. He said, well, no, it's going to be. He said, it's, it's cost a lot of money. It's going to be. It's going to be better than this. And we started battling. And he said, it's going to be better. He just insisted. And then Blaine sort of shook her head. He looked at her and he said, I can get better than this, can't I? And she shook her head and said, Donald, you're just never going to understand, are you? 
Workmen pounded away on Trump's apartment for three years. His downstairs neighbors stopped making her monthly payments. Lawsuits flew in both directions. I wanted to move in here because I thought it was going to be a great building with fantastic views and also a bigger apartment than what I used to have. However, I never expected to have all these run-ins with my neighbor, who is Donald Trump, who lives above me. And since I moved in, he has done nothing else but construction. The building of Trump Tower was the true art of the deal. Saving money was the key. Chapter 1. Hire the cheapest demolition contractor you can find, even though he has little experience. Trump hired William Kosicki, whose principal business was window washing. Kosicki, in turn, hired what became known as the Polish Brigade, more than 200 immigrants with no working papers who were paid one-third the union rate and worked under difficult conditions. Years later, deny you ever knew they were there, even though you visited the site. They were sleeping in the building. They had no protective equipment. All the OSHA requirements were being ignored. They had no masks, they had no gloves. They were stripping wires with their bare hands, hot electrical wires. Chapter two, don't tell anyone that the building contains asbestos. The reason, asbestos is costly to remove and dispose of. Trump says he isn't legally responsible. The law says he is. With the danger that was involved in working there, because all the wires, a lot of construction, it was covered with asbestos. Chapter 3. Hire a waste hauler who doesn't care what he carts and knows how not to leave tracks. Trump's demolition contractor got Eddie Garofolo, identified by law enforcement officials as mob-connected. In August of 1990, while reportedly cooperating with federal authorities investigating racketeering in the construction trades, Garofolo was shot to death gangland style in his driveway. In the dead man's pocket, a wad of cash and a high-rated comp card for the Trump Taj Mahal. Chapter 4. When the demolition begins, appear to be public-spirited. Promise artifacts from the building to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Chapter 5. Jackhammer the artifacts when you learn the cost of saving them. The demolition contractor allegedly said that it was going to take a long time or a longer time to take those heavy panels down. And before anybody could make a decision, Trump apparently gave the orders to have them demolished. Chapter 6. Threaten the lawyer that the Polish illegals hire after your cheap contractor defaults on paying them. Make sure that the threats aren't traceable in case the guy isn't scared off. Mr. Barron had told me in the one telephone conversation that he, I had with him that Donald Trump was upset because I was ruining his credit reputation by filing the mechanics liens and that Mr. Trump was thinking of filing a, a personal lawsuit against me for a hundred million dollars for defaming his uh, reputation. It turned out that Mr. Barron was Donald Trump's favorite alias. When this was revealed, Trump said, what of it? Ernest Hemingway used the pen name, didn't he? Chapter 7. Manage to stay out of trouble when your contractor is tried, found guilty, and fined for not paying his Polish illegals. And at any moment, uh, this should have fell out of bed. Now, the people you've got to ask the questions for is, is over in Newark, New Jersey, in the Department of Justice, uh, where, interestingly enough, Donald's sister worked. She was the number three person in the office. The assistant U.S. attorney said, don't mention the name Trump in, inside here. If you want to talk about Trump, just say, let's go outside and take a walk. At the time, Trump's sister was an assistant in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark. Today, she's a federal judge. Chapter 8. Have Daniel Sullivan make peace between the union and non-union workers on the tower. In late July, July 27, Donald called me and uh, asked me to please come to New York because he had a major problem the employees he represented on the demolition of the Bonwood Teller building were going to hang one of his vice presidents, Tom McCary, off the building. Prevent the hanging, but a decade later face legal charges that you defrauded the union pension and welfare fund. 
Chapter 9. To build the largest concrete structure in New York City, turn again to Roy Cohn. Cohn is also the lawyer for the New York crime boss who controls the concrete business. Payoffs from contractors are dropped off at Cohn's office, so he may get paid twice for his services here. But then, you get who you pay for. Conclusion. In every respect, the building was pure Trump. Behind every facade, another facade. When you're going to spend the kind of money that we've spent on a building where we spend for the finest marble, for the finest bronze, for the finest everything else, you have to be careful to be perfectly honest because it really does add to your risk. And we decided to go absolutely first class all the way and it's something we're very happy that we did. He calls it Trump Tower. It's money power that'll get you up where you want to.